Hey, welcome in everybody to the latest edition of the Grittiest Take as we are here to talk about the latest and the greatest involving our Philadelphia Flyers who are currently at the recording of this podcast on a three-game winning streak as we're here on December 16th heading into Montreal, Quebec to try to beat the Canadians who have a lot of guys um, out for their team, much more so than even the Flyers. But first and foremost, Steele, how are you doing this evening? Oh, man, I'll tell you what, I'm doing great. I'm doing fabulous. We're just about two weeks away from Christmas. And, you know, I, I get into that festive time of year, and it always makes me well, a little think bit about less now. Cause we're yeah, a little bit less. Year. But it always makes me think of the Flyers. Because I'm here to tell you, this is a very key point in time for this team during the year, I think. And the last couple of years have been good for this particular time frame that I'm talking about, like the Christmas break up to the All-Stars. Like once you get past that first part of the, the that first 20 games, first 25 games mm-hmm. of the season, and then you get into that second, like, quarter, the second quarter, like to, to make to the half to, to where you get to the All-Star break. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So this time period needs to be major for the Flyers. So other than that, man, I'm doing great. I like seeing the team win, uh, but a lot of things have gone on. A lot of things have changed, and wow. Yeah, I mean, it looks like after the Christmas break, I saw, I think Jamie tweeted and a couple other people tweeted, one, Brass is definitely, which should be on track to be back. Tanner's been skating. Lazinski, who was. Yeah, I saw that. Yep. Allison's played a couple of games yes. with Lehigh. So you're starting to have the depth where it, it wasn't our team never had depth. It was you had too many Hurt people depth. out at once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that, <laughs> that would have that been the people that you had in. So then you kept going to like the fifth op. Like, like when you go down options. That's just what happened. But yeah. now that you start having people come back, minus Frost being out for COVID protocols, Faraby being out, who's supposed to be back, it seems, after the break as well. And then Brass okay. being out probably should be back after the break. Okay. Uh, I think the big thing though, with this team is under the new coaching staff, that's mostly Darrell Williams and Mike Yo, since they have just people filling in at different times, like Nick Schultz. But Yo even said that he, those two are basically doing everything when it comes to game planning. You're right. Um, what has been your biggest noticing factors to why this team has looked better in the last three games, particularly uh, in the Mike Yo era, but has started looking better as a whole in the Mike Yo era compared to the end of the AV and Michelle Terry in here? Uh, well, look, my, mm, I'm going to give you a, an, an educated opinion here on this, and, and it might not be the one you want to hear, but – I think there's a lot more going on here on this team than the coach. And I think what's going on here is that the team wasn't playing under AV, wasn't accepting his message, wasn't doing the things that he wanted to do. He had no answers and excuses at the end of the season last year, and then he had no answers for the first 20 games of this year. So that, to me, is a, is, a, is a coach who has lost his team. So to me, that means the team didn't, wasn't playing under him. Now they kind of got a new set of guys, kind of, sort of. And so it sounds like... Voices, because you weren't listening to them, those two guys as the main voices. You were listening to the other two that got fired as the right. um, main voice. The only people that were listening to Yo as the main voice were the d- defense, basically. Exactly, exactly. And so... Now it's a new voice. Now there's different guys behind the bench saying things. Um, I I hear that Yo is tough on players uh, as far as being keeping them accountable and things of that nature. But I think that's what's important to point out because tough on players is a different thing than keeping players accountable. Like when I've watched a podcast where Pacioretty, um talked about it, Max Pacioretty with Vegas. Yeah, like there's coaches that are too old school nowadays where I'm not saying a V was that, but I'm, but like, I feel like yo is somebody that more is accountability where I don't usually like using the phrase tough on players. Cause people skew that to thinking they're the people that get right in their face and are like yelling at them. Like it's back into the seventies 
or they're like slapping them across the face to tell them like 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 I feel like that gets skewed poorly. Yeah, but, no, I don't mean it that way. Yeah, I mean it. I was I, you did. I'm just saying that okay. phrase. That's, that okay. Okay. Like, yeah. Um, to break that down for you, uh, to make it a little bit more clear, he's tough on players because he is he makes them accountable. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to call that tough on players, then that's what you call it. Okay. Uh, I, for one, accountability driven coach. That's what I, how I would put it. Okay. Right. And so <laughs> that can make it tough on players. Because, yeah, but AB was an accountability <clears throat> driven. It was just different. He was more of a motivator style accountability driven coach, where Yo, I think, is more of a like, this is the strategy we got to do to get it done. And I'm going to hold you. I think there's just this is just a different structure, basically. Agreed. Agreed. Um, a lot of players were shipped out during the offseason. A lot of players were brought in. Um, I At the end of last season, I was I ate a lot of crow um, and I talked about it a lot on multiple shows, Hockey Writers Inc. and other shows that I've done where um, I really felt that there should have been more stock taken in what happened last year than what was taken. And so a lot of things progressed. Particularly special teams wise at the very least. Exactly. Exactly. But a lot of things progressed towards the end that there wasn't a lot of stock taken into last year. And the fact that they basically – Chuck Fletcher went all in by drafting or giving up draft picks to bring in guys to play either under Hayes to build around Hayes or to build around Hayes and then with the AV system or some combination thereof. It was all these AV guys that all played with Hayes. Well, that's because they had – the, it, it, they kind of essentially <clears throat> became a mini factor of how the Eagles gave Chip Kelly all the rule. Obviously, the Flyers didn't give AV all the rule, but he physically did everything with Fletcher and said, like, this is this, this is that, we should do this, we should do that. So that's a yeah. different strategy than some teams would implement, where it, it, he has been a one of the all-time winningest coaches in the league, so it makes sense that you might, it, from that perspective, put faith into him on that realm but at certain point you have to just do what you got to do but at the, but at the same time those are those players haven't really like we can say we built it around Hayes and everything but the players that they brought in have not been the issue players for most of the year like Cam went cold for a bit but he's on pace for 30 something goals um you have if he can stay at his pace Brett Broussard Brass has been one of our most consistent forwards before he got injured and then uh, Risto has his flaws, but has been solid. It's just I wouldn't pay Risto Line in seven or seven and a half million dollars after this year, but right. he, he's been good for good for what he is. Um, right. So uh, I think like the the big thing more is what you started with for me is the message that AB had. It's just certain times you lose it, and from everybody I've kind of been listening to, whether it's like uh, for for our people or any other podcast I listen to. Um, it's when he kind of lost the room, but at the same time, he just lost the way, like you said, to figure it out. And the thing is he lost the systematic ability to adjust where he kind of just went to, this is the way that I do it. And basically pulled a chip Kelly and just kept doing something that clearly was not working anymore with the roster you have, because we're seeing right now. If you keep the possession, which I'll let you speak to because I want to ask you on this, but if you keep the possession into the zone and you hold the puck through the neutral zone in, like we've been doing more with Yo, that's going to lead to more offense, particularly with a team like this when you have guys like Atkinson and you have TK. Like if you're somebody like St. Louis that has people that are going to pound you at the boards, yeah, dumping and chasing on a couple of your lines, that makes some logistical sense. With the Flyers, it really rarely made any sense. But they still mix it in, but they mix it in when it should be used. Vasily um, said that on the uh, Nitty Gritty podcast, where like if you like if you see uh, the defenseman pitching the line, then you're going to dump it in and let everybody go past the defense. Okay. 
I get what you're saying. But but you strategically use it where with AV, nine times out of ten at the end of the AV year, because they seemed like they weren't bought into the system anymore and it wasn't drawing anyone open, it was consistently dumped. And also it was consistently one guy in. So what do you think of the improvements of just actually entering the zone and also exiting the zone? Well, I have to kind of see some to to speak on it, to be honest with you. Um, They're still really sloppy. They're still not making passes right. They're still making bad decisions. They're still playing lazy. Look, there's a lot of things, like I said, that I feel are what's going on with this team. And there's certain players that I feel should probably not be playing. And and I get it because we're we're missing guys due to injury and things of that nature and stuff like that. But my biggest thing is this. This whole dump and chase thing is to me very minor league. We when you spoke on it, you said that you have a really good chance of keeping possession of the puck when you skate the puck in. How's this for a chance? Anywhere from 80 to 86% of the time that you skate the puck in results in a shot on goal. Yeah, but I also think, like, uh, we've been still a little sloppy, but I think we've been significantly less sloppy since you. Okay, I agree. Because we played with better pace, and we got through the zone quicker and made decisions much quicker. It's kind of like you're slowly adjusting where we haven't got to where – if you look at the Canucks, their efficiency has skyrocketed under Boudreaux. The Flyers' efficiency has gone up in good intervals, but it's just it's just interval <clears throat> where it's not to the same effect of Boudreaux, which is right. immediate skyrocket right. of everything. But you're no, being, I'm with you. I'm with you. Being much better possessionally, like we have been, even if you're still a little sloppy, you're going to win more games that way because then eventually you'll get unsloppy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So like, it, you're, the you're fact that we get better yeah, possessionally with Yo is going to take you a long way as well. But here's the problem, though. See, the Flyers are not a good enough team to dump and chase the puck. They well, are not fast enough the and they're not physical good. enough yeah. to win the battles to get the puck when they dump it in. So it, if you continually do that... On a regular basis, which they have done. Now, okay, the last three games, there's been a lot less of that. The last three games, there's been some pace. The last three games, there's been some improvements. The passes have been a little crisper and whatever the case is. But seriously, we're only talking about the last three games. Oh, no, Andrew and I said that when we were on. It's a small sample, but it's something to build on because your right. reef puts it a good way. This team, we might make, with the way this team's history has been, we're probably going to make the damn playoffs. Lose 10 yeah. straight. We lost 10 straight two times in our history. So, like I Made said. Made the postseason. We won 10 straight a couple of years ago. Guess what we did? Columbus came back in the standings. I think it was a 17-game winning streak. Mm-hmm. And then they made the postseason, and we did not. So That's like, right. That's so exactly the, right. The history of this team would play okay. somehow well, this year. Well, let me pose a question to you then. All right? Let me pose a question to you then. What good is it to get just enough wins to make it to the playoffs and then get crushed in the first round? What good is that? When, if, uh, you know. It depends who's in at that point because I feel like your lineup, like if you have guys like Wade playing a, a, a significant role, if you have guys like. Like Lindblom's Bailey, like he played at a at a very lower level of himself in the playoffs. So actually getting experience when he's fully himself would be a good asset for him. I, I feel like also when you're a team, we've seen it multitudes of times. The NHL playoffs might be one of the most unpredictable playoffs. Agreed. So if you like we shouldn't have been in the That's cup. That's why we love them. Made the, like, like the year we made the cup, we had no business being in the Stanley Cup roster wise. Look, roster wise, correct. Yeah. So and then when you look at this roster now, even with the guys that are out and the guys that are supposed to be, you know, whatever. See, that's the other thing, too, that I think bodes to the issue with because it's going on with the Flyers, because the guys that are coming up through the system are really not really <laughs> most of all the picks that Hextall made are really 
A lot of it's had to do with injuries, though, and I can't blame a guy for picking. I, I'm not talking about injuries. I'm just talking about guys that are not good enough to even wear the flyer sweater. Okay, that that have been picked that are in the system that are supposed to be all these great prospects. Well, where are they? They're, they don't exist as far as I'm concerned. OK, that I really feel that Philadelphia really needs to just kind of start over. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at here with this team. Uh, yeah, we won some three games. Great. OK, but in the end, you're probably not going to keep you as the coach. Right. Maybe, yeah, we'll have to see because I, I at first I didn't think so, but he's not Gordon. Gordon, like in the NHL, was never much of a renowned guy in the NHL. He was one of the all-time winners in the AHL, where Yo has more experience at a younger age, and I think it was like four years in Minnesota. Yeah, but he doesn't and, have a very good winning record. It, it was all right for a guy at that young of a because putting things in perspective, he got thrown in when he just basically was just getting his beak wet and even being in that capacity. So, okay. I mean, it, it was it was all right. I mean, I think the the whole point of a coach, though, is the head coach. Everybody looks at the head coach as he does everything too many times, I think, too, where your coaching staff, just like it does in baseball, plays as big of an impact into your team as your head coach does. Because if you have – like, that's why I feel like the the way that the – Flyers honestly, personally, could have saved if they wanted to keep AV and the way they built the team around would be of getting rid of Michelle Terry because I think he was the sour apple of the coaching staff first and foremost before AV. Um, so like that, that's why um, I feel like the upper management has kind of made some off decisions. But when it comes to the overall team, we have guys that have performed before. I think it's just system. We played a flaw. We talked about it on our show, the JB and Steel show, but we played a flawed system yeah. for this team where if you start recovering, there's still a while to the trade deadline. Um, if Frost keeps playing the way that he was playing, went in and doesn't have COVID, and then uh, Faraby comes back and plays well, I mean, I think you have the – Depth, you just have to have the top six keep doing what you're doing because the bottom six would have had depth if Allison and Lazinski. Okay, I get what you're saying. Injured. You got Brown, you got Hewitt. Okay, uh, Kate so was supposed to play last week, but then never played. Now he's gonna right. play tonight. So we're looking at another 10 games for these people to come back, starting to come back at least 10 games. Well, the thing is, though, we don't have to worry about it like that, though, because we have the entire Christmas break. I understand so, that, but I'm yeah. talking about 10 games is going to go between now and the Christmas break, right? I don't think we have 10 games between now and the Christmas break. No, we only have, after tonight, three games, and then we're off between the 24th to the 28th. Okay, so that's only four days off, and then how many games do we have until the first of the year? Another three more games? Two, it would okay. be the last, the, the third to last, the second to last day of December. 29th is Seattle in Seattle. 30th is San Jose. Okay, that's only five games. So you're telling me that within five game times that we're going to have, who'd you say, Ellis back? I don't know about Ellis. Ellis is the Or not Ellis, player. I'm sorry. Um, Allison. But Allison, they could call up whenever they want because he's already been playing. Right. So that's who their else? own first view at that point. Uh, Faraby, Faraby has already been skating. Okay. Lazinski, I would say, is probably more the beginning of January, but may maybe. Mm -hmm. But I also think you're probably going to give him with the way Brown's playing. You you might as well give him AHL time. So right, that's what I mean. Uh, yeah, where Broussard, I think, is the guy that will probably be back around the same time as Joel, and then Frost will be back quick because he just needs to clear protocols. And then okay, hopefully. and then Ellis, there's, they're talking about maybe after the break or after the the. Uh, yeah, I thought I thought I swore I saw yeah something come out. I could be wrong, but I swore I saw a tweet come out that he's ahead of schedule and okay, should be well, back sometime great. in the beginning of January. Hopefully. Okay, great. So no matter how you slice it, we're still looking at the beginning of the year. Which is well, yeah, but on more schedule weeks. is still people. Like, for example, you should take advantage of Montreal. Ottawa's a better competitive team than Arizona and Montreal, but you should still beat Ottawa, uh, especially here. Um, and then you could split. If, if we play a better possession game, particularly if they still have a million people out of the lineup, uh, we could beat one of Pittsburgh or 
Washington, if we can get that, you would have at that point, if you can win the next two, you would be at five. And then if you can lose, even if you lose to Washington, you would then be Pittsburgh. You would only you would only lose one wow. to the Chris, which is very possible with the schedule because we had the other thing we have to remember is it's not an excuse; it's more just an observation. But with the losing streak and everybody that was going out and everything, we had great. The, I think it was the second hardest or the hardest schedule in the league. The hardest, yeah, the hardest now, schedule. Yeah, this month we have one of the easier schedules in the league. Uh, but you, look, okay, but all right, all right. Uh, okay. That's how you can recover, make up in this league. Yeah, right. only at a quarter mark. I don't think you can overreact to a team at the at a quarter mark when we've been in this spot before two times in our history, and it's turned out playoffs. That's okay, more. so I look at, I'm looking at the the, the Thursday the, the tonight game Montreal. Then I look at the Senators. That's Saturday. Then I look at Tuesday the 21st. That's the Capitals, and that so that's four games, and the 23rd is the Penguins. Yeah, okay? that, that's the four days. So that's four games, right? I, I really, ha- it. I don't know if they can split that because I think Montreal and Ottawa are going to play them much better than what they think. And the only other game in there is then after the break is the Kraken. Personally, and, I think we should kill Montreal. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, they yeah. Could play us better, but they don't have, like, Laurent Dolphin right now is their second, which nothing against him, but he shouldn't be playing on the second line. Right. Uh, Jesse Yolanin, again, shouldn't be playing on the second line. Nothing against the kids that shouldn't be saying on the second line at this point. Right. Um, Hoffman's having an awful season, so you don't want to give him shots. Like I said in my preview to the game that I did, you still can't give these guys shots like Matthew. Perlis. Oh, yeah, no, you can't. But they're just not – they have the guys that you would be the most afraid of, like the Gallagher's of the world, uh, the Toffoli's of the world, shooting the puck and scoring out of the lineup. And then Niku's out, who's one of the better defenders. To full, or I already said to full, Anderson's out, Dvorak's out. Right. I feel like if we lose to Montreal, that – that you like, you have to find a way to beat them when they have that many people out, even if you have Farabee combined with Frost at this point. I mean, you know what I'm saying. I agree with you 100, percent Pro Joe. I really do. I, I'm not sure. Ottawa, I haven't looked at yet. Who's, um, who's, but there's seven total games for the Flyers from now until they come back January 1st. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's a game on the 30th, and then there's a game on the first. Okay, that's the Sharks and the Kings. Um, in a West Coast swing at the, the at the at the beginning of the year, and I just this is why I was asking you these questions because I don't think that by the time some of these players start getting back that they're going to be able to get out of this hole. Well, we're only four points out right now. Okay, but you and I both know that. You go on a bender and win oh, three sorry, or four games. Right now. Okay, you go on a bender and win three or four games, and that's instantly eight points, right? Okay, uh-huh. so – and the teams that are ahead of us are much better teams. Yeah. I don't think Columbus is a much better team than us. I no, but I'm the- talking about the head of the division. Well, I don't care about the division because I don't think the Flyers are winning the division this year. I think if they yeah, get but we're in- not even going to make it. If they get into the, they're going to be competing with Pittsburgh or Detroit. Where if Detroit, Detroit, I think eventually is going to come back to reality. They've been way ahead of their. Where the Ducks have been ahead of their rebuild, but Detroit has leaps and bounds been ahead of where people thought they were this year. Agreed. So I feel like they'll come back to reality. Boston, I feel like, is the team to watch out for because they're going to get Rask. Now there's rumors about Krejci might still want to eventually come back over. So there's different things to watch there. But CBJ with guys that you've had, like Danforth, who I'm going to do a video on eventually stepping up as a as an unexpected guy. But like they had all, a lot of unexpected players stepping up where sometimes that gasoline runs out at a certain point. Where if you look at our team, like Yarif was talking about, TK has a lot more than he's shown. So if he get he's been better assist wise lately. So if he can get that going goal wise, you got that. Lawden's been better on the first line. 
uh, Lindblom's been much better with. Well, that's also because Lindblom hasn't been buried playing five minutes a night. So that's right. why he's been much better. And then, so I think if you can push it to the end of this month and be in a good spot and stay, let's say, like three to two points out of the wild card, you, you're going to be fine by the time people come back where. I think we all just got it. I said it before on the shows. We all got into panic time because of last season. If we had last year, like the season before, where even we crapped the bed in the second round of the playoffs, we would not have went into panic time as much with the 10 game losing streak. Cause you would have went, we might not even have fired AV to be honest. Cause you would have went last season was good again, but then we collapsed in the playoffs. Like okay, 19, but- 20, where even if we did fire AV and you were getting going now, you would have more of a mindset of, oh, we're looking like the miniature recovery of the Canucks. We're not there yet, but we're recovering with our coach, where now it's more everybody's stuck in the, when everything collapses into the well, it goes all the way down into the sewer. Like, that. Like that's kind of I'm, where everybody's stuck. Yeah, at. I'm with you, I'm with you, but I really think they should have fired AV at the end of last season, because I think that not firing AV at the end of last season kicked off a series of events that Chuck did that significantly altered the makeup of this team. And I think that if they would have fired AV at that point and gotten a new coach and a new voice, then the team would have done different moves and would have made different adjustments and would have brought in different players because it would have been a new voice and a different guy looking at things. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the fact that, yeah, that that's I why I feel that upper you know. management and I think the, the everything just all the way down, just there was bad decisions made all the way down. Okay. Well, it's top. De- it's top. That's de- what I mean. And, yeah. 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 And um, everybody's ta- I mean, people talked about it with other organizations as well. Like I've heard about it with the Canucks of late when um they brought in all these new people. It, it was a top down thing. Benning was getting old. People were tired of Jim Benning. And it was a top-down thing with their team where they, they had literally had one of their owners, people, fly to meet Jim Rutherford because he was like, oh, I'm in my 70s. I'm also not feeling well. At the current moment, he wasn't feeling well. Do I really want to go back into work? And then yeah, this right. person flew down there to make sure that. that so like, I, I, think the, I think the thing with the Flyers, though, is you have – what you did was, I think ownership obviously had a say in the decision of letting AV pay or Fletcher. I don't think that could have just been a GM and coach decision saying we're going to basically have the coach be the de facto secondhand man and just throw the assistant GM by the wayside. Like, I don't think that's a, okay. those two decisions. So I feel like that also fits into the top down thing. But at the same time, those moves, like I said, we still have all of our first round picks. We just need to make make sure we hit on them, which like you said in recent shows that we have been better with with Fletch, where Forster unfortunately got injured. Yeah, but no, see, not- see what, uh, what what I was trying to differentiate was the different the difference between the Hextall picks and the Fletcher picks. More of the Fletcher picks are turning out to be better players. And able to make an impact on the team, whereas the Hextall players are not making impacts on the team and have fallen by the wayside and need to go. And that's why I feel this well, the team. The 2019 draft as a whole looks pretty good because you got York, you got Brink, Millman. Looks that's like what I'm. But see, that's not a Hextall draft. Defenseman. No, no, no. Yeah, that's true. Like the last guy that I really like that Hextall got in the middle round. Is Wiley, who I recently wrote an article about. Uh, okay, like, right. Like and the, the other, the other that only just a- defensive defense. Yeah, like that guy that's like you. You always look for that just plays the game defensively, yeah. right, yeah. and doesn't do anything overly okay. impressive. But you right. like to have on your defense. So that to me, I think, was the big issue there, as well. Where, yes, he restocked the ca- cabinets with um, quote unquote prospects, but in the end. How good are these prospects? Not very good. Fletcher has done a much better job of restocking the shelves with better prospects than Hextall did. I feel like the Flyers, to me, though, the part I disagree with there is I think we actually have a lot of talented prospects. We just had a Phillies-level development system where you're starting to bring in different people to develop people now. But it was the same thing with the Phillies because you have people go elsewhere. We've had prospects go out. 
I I think they're fine because when people go, even if they go overseas, then they're fine. Like the the Flyers need to oh, I see put what you're people in the right spots in the minors so they're in that spot in the majors. They're ready for it because the yeah, like Chris Mayer said, like you want to win in the AHL, but ultimately it is a development league. But you can develop guys and win if you know how to coach and strategically do it the right way. Lappy's starting to get there the last couple games, so it looks like he's adjusting, but he's just not fully there yet. He's more of a development guy. But that's why you brought him in, because you see the young guys with him, even like Matthew Strome, who's up now playing center when he's played most of the wing. He's starting to gel more with a guy like Lappy, who pushes the young players more and lets the veterans kind of take yeah. the seat to the youngsters, which yeah. was the opposite of Gordon. So yeah. I feel like the way that our development system, not necessarily the coaching structure, because Lappy has to get better at that, but the way we're developing will help better now. Because before I was, it was the Flyers were kind of the same thing to the Phillies for me, where it's like you keep drafting guys that all these scouts say and all these films, you look at them and how talented they are, and you destroy them. Like, like, like you, 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 you just don't have them pan out because you don't, it doesn't work and you put them in fourth line positions or something in the, like, you, you, you have to figure it out just like the Phillies adjusted a lot of their development team. The Flyers slowly started doing that with Fletcher. And I think that's starting to help right. seeing guys, even from the Hextall era, start to pick it up. Like, um, Ratcliffe, when he's been healthy, has started to pick it up a lot. Um, Rube's off when healthy's been fine. His 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 own issue is health. Um, but like you've had guys under Lappy that look like they're starting to pick it up. Where I think it's been more of a development failure than it's been. You don't have. Uh, I agree with that a hundred percent. Which is why I think that this whole thing needs to change from the top down because I believe that that's one of the other problems. So. Well, in that respect, Fletcher, though, we just complimented on the draft where I feel like it would be more the top problem now, I think, is more, which is not going to change the top top. What right. you, yeah, where you're not going to I don't think confidence is going to sell the team anytime soon. So. Well, it's not necessarily them selling the team as to or maybe having ha- maybe having a person who. Well, anyway, uh, you know, I have my own opinions about what I think is going on. And so I think there's a lot of things that need to happen for this team to be successful. I don't think it's going to be this year and I don't think it's going to be next year because let me pose this other question to you. And we talked about this on the JB and Steel show, right? So when G leaves, because we all know it's it's going to happen, right? Come on, let's even if it doesn't happen. Okay, even if it doesn't happen, right? You still have to have somebody else besides him to hang on the side of the building, right? I still think G might be. I said it. I forget whose pot it was on. It might have been Pirlo's, but I feel like G might just be Getzlaff and just be committed to the original team he went to and just ride and die through the entire thing and just well do what Ryan's done. As a Flyer fan, we're hoping for that, but as a as an analyst and somebody who looks at the X and O's and looks at and breaks it down, he broke off negotiations early by not continuing them on over the summer and throughout the season. Um, That doesn't bode well. Then you got the fact that he's from Ottawa. Ottawa could probably offer him the money that he's making now, if not more, because let's face it, Philadelphia is not going to not be in any position to offer him anything more than maybe four or five million dollars a year. Well, we have a little bit more cap space than that. Next but year. we still have to re-sign another backup goalie and... Da 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 da. Rista Linen's gonna be done after this year. He's gonna need paid or whatever, whatever. Well, you know who knows. That's what I'm saying. I I would much rather not have that hang over my head because I'm here to tell you I do not think the Flyers are gonna be able to offer him that kind of money. Uh, I mean, the Flyers have otherwise. You have Limblum until after 2023. Like everybody else is locked in for a little Agreed. bit minus the minus the fourth line. Agreed. To, a couple guys. Fairby's locked in because you gave him a contract. Frost, you're going to keep around. And he's not going to be expensive um, if he doesn't have next year. I forget if he has next year. Um, where 
JVR, I think, will be traded because you only would have one year left. So somebody might take if you eat that salary. I think with one year left, that's a lot easier to make that deal. That's then, why he hasn't been able to be moved because nobody's yeah. taken that salary. Seven point um, two five million for somebody who can barely put twenty goals up a season. No, yeah, but I think if it's one year and he does get to like if he can go on one of those runs like he has a couple <laughs> better games the last two and get to the seventeen to twenty mark, somebody for the final season, if you make it five million or four and a half, somebody would take JVR probably. Um <coughs> I'm not saying that he's not that somebody won't take him. I'm just saying that not with the contract that he has, not without Philadelphia being able to eat some of that contract no, with, or whatever the case is. I don't think you have to, like, y- yeah. it'll be a lot easier to trade him because you're only yeah. taking him with and you're bringing him in for one, right. one season. Philadelphia is currently nine points out of fourth place in the division. Okay. So that is a pretty big hole, my friend. That is a pretty big hole. And well, that's if we're looking at the division. We're only five points out of the wild card. Oh, five points out of the wild card. All right. Yeah. Still, though, five points is a lot, especially in an 82 game season where you remember last year yeah. where, you know, it was a compressed season. So you played five games, got 10 points, man. That was a big deal because that was almost worth 20 points. Almost. Oh yeah, but now we're not playing a compressed. Right, like, that's what like I mean. So you you're five points down. That's a lot of games to make up, and and the teams ahead well, of I us. I look at it the other way because it's not a compressed season. I feel like you don't have to worry as much if you're five points down this year as you had to last year. Because last year you had a shortened season. This year you have the marathon, not the sprint. So okay, if uh, you can, you have time to get what or get wild card, get overtime points. Yeah, uh, to make up the wild card mm-hmm. as well, and even just mm-hmm. that way, like the Flyers have done in some past seasons, being one of the bigger overtime points teams in the league. See, you know, this goes to show you what you were talking about, okay? And we talked about it, I think, on the JB and Steel show. I think it was like the first one that we did, where we talked about we c- we could make a team of X. Flyers players that have their name on the cup, we could make a team, right? Yeah, Richards, Carter, Williams, Sharp. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, right? The in, list the goes on and on and on, and on and on and on and on, right? So what that, I think, goes to what you said, where this team is failing to develop players and then – Failing to either have a coach or a system that to put the right place. that puts those players in the right place. Look, I don't care what anybody because I don't know how we have. Like, I understand when people say junior stats don't. Oh, obviously they don't always translate to the pros. We see that all the time. But the Flyers draft a bunch of people that their junior stats are ridiculous, and then they come to the pros and you somehow mess up their development like that. You don't where see does, that yeah, where does all that production? Yeah, like you don't see that happen in other organizations. Right. Where that's why I'm not putting it on the players as much as some other people because it's the same with the Phillies. They got too hard into the analytics where it was basically maybe the Flyers have done the same thing or maybe they haven't done enough of using new age stuff. Like maybe they're too old school, but you have to be balanced in the in, in both of these things, and that's what gets uh, you at the best. Yeah, and Hextall – he was the one that tried to bring the analytics in. Okay. And he was, you know, look, something's something's going on here when you fire two Stanley Cup coaches. I mean, in the last 10 years, 11, uh, almost 12 years now, in the last 12 years, how many coaches have the Flyers had? One every 2.5 years is the average. Yeah. No, we have. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why I think it's – with Schneider, it was from a different perspective of if you didn't perform, he was a quick to pull the yep, plug. Yep, pull the plug. Guy, where with Comcast, it's more <clears throat> you're not running the team well from the top down, and that's why you've had to make the decisions you have to make because you're trying to put the scapegoat basically on the people below you because you're the ones that aren't doing what you're Wow, doing. thank you, Joe. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Joe, very much. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. No, no, seriously, because look, 
as a fan, you look at the team in one way, as one perspective, as a fan. You want to see the team do well. You get really angry and upset when they lose. Why does the team lose? Blah, blah, blah. And when they win, you're all excited and happy and the jersey's back on and everything's cool and great. But I see the numbers end of it and I see the back end of it and I see it from a whole different angle. Okay. And I see a lot of things that are going on here with this team that need to be improved. Okay. And it's, it's not just coaching. It's player development. It's from the top down. It no, I is completely strictly agree. from the top down I needs completely. to be gutted and restart again, refresh you, you got to sell off as many of the assets as you possibly can because you're not going to have any space to do anything. Why keep trying to put a Band-Aid on a broken dam? Yeah, the, the one thing that I feel like the Flyers have, like Provorov still only 24, Konechny's 24. Yes, Lord yes there's a couple like, of guys. You have a lot a of guys one. I think yes. you should keep around. The guys you should try to move in the offseason are guys like JVR if you can get rid of them. Atkinson's exactly. a debatable guy, depending what you decide to do with him. Um, Risto, depending what you're doing with this season, if you're not going to re-sign him, then you might as well. But that depends what your end goal is of what, what you're deciding. So like I said, and and okay. that's all going to be a whole different voice because – But that's now, what I mean when I mean trade people. Like, I don't want to trade any of the – like, if they trade Farabee or somebody like that or trade, like – well, uh, that's just stupid. Yeah, they shouldn't trade any of the younger group to get. Right. It. That's what I mean. I want to keep those young guys there. I want to keep those young guys there because they are good players. They have talent. They have skill. You just signed Joel Faraby and, and Sean Couturier to these extensions. And, and Lindblom you, even, too, for the three. And Lindblom, let's sprinkle him in there, too, while you're at it. And Proveroff while we're there. And And you're not building the team around those guys? You're building the team around Hayes? Come on! That, to me, is a problem. That, to me, is an issue. Okay? I think Hayes is a fill-in guy at best. I, he's not a guy that's going to be hanging from the, the freaking well, side of the building. Guy. I just think he is what he is. He's a, he's a, he's a third-line great exactly. defensive. Or, exactly. Or if he's healthy fully, he can be a second-line, like can a 9 he? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. See, Joe, that's, that's but but right. that but that's kind of why like I, I wouldn't consider that a fill in because I would consider that like a a piece of the puzzle play where a fill in player more is. Like, but yeah, okay, but fill-in players like Nate Thompson, like those are usually the guys you consider fill in players. Because, okay, because look how well they did without him or bad, and they haven't done that much better or with or without him. Do you see what I'm saying? I so, think. Flyers have looked a bit better with Hayes, mostly because I think Hayes has looked a bit better with himself. Like, I think he rushed himself back a little. Now, the team shouldn't have allowed him to do that. So there's that side of it. But I do think he kind of rushed himself back earlier in the season, do too. Do you put Hayes yeah. on the same level as Giroux? No, but I don't put anybody. I don't even put, like, in terms of defensive game, sure, yeah, Cooch is there. He won a selkie. But in terms of, like, overall what you can do in the overall game on offense, I don't put anybody on our team on the same level as Drew. So, and there isn't even anybody on the team now that can replace him. Yeah, but By I By committee, th we could, but not one for one. No, but I do think that's why I think as a closing point, as we're wrapping up here, getting to like Pirlo would say our full 42, but I think <laughs> moving to back to center, I was wrong there where I thought they didn't keep him at center because of his hands and everything. He's where he's had the injuries in the past, but he's looked actually, he's, he looked fine on the wing. That's his natural position. He's looked very good at center since moving back there. And uh, Atkinson and, well, it was Frost. That line seemed to be finding some right. Kind of other because they have the speed yeah Atkinson Limblum and Giroux because Frost is on COVID protocol but um I think you added speed too like the reason why I understand what they were doing by trying to call up some of the guys that add more jam as Lavi would say but like we said this team doesn't have enough speed so like having guys like Wilman play and Yo putting him into the positions he's putting him in rather than the positions AV and Terry and put him in 
that helps because he kind of replaces the knack with the undisciplined side not being yep. mm-hmm. uh, a player in the lineup. Where, where um, obviously it is going to hurt not having as deep of a depth because you're not going to have Brash or you're not going to have anybody there for your fourth line. But yeah. um, Cates, I thought, and I think I want to say it was like six games maybe, when he got signed, he played like a, a handful of games last year. I didn't think he looked bad on the fourth line. He just is one of those players that he is what he is. Yeah. But, but like what you get is what you see, basically, which is nothing yeah. wrong with that. Right, uh, right, he's right. one of those players where you don't sign an undrafted guy going. Now, if he develops into Logan O'Connor on the damn <laughs> uh, avalanche, that's great. But you yeah, right. We'll take that all day. You don't sign an undrafted guy going, OK, this is the answer here, ladies and gentlemen. We are now saving our entire franchise. Because if you did, then you should be fired on the spot. So that's, that's- uh, Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> So I yeah. agree with that 100%. <laughs> so for my closing point, I'm going to say this. I think this team is going to be lucky if they make the playoffs. And what I mean by lucky, I mean by very lucky. Like they're going to need a lot of help. And I think that the only way it's going to happen is if some major things happen at the trade deadline. And even then, I still don't think it's going to be players. It's going to be picks. OK, I really feel this team needs to basically start over, keep the core young players, get Proveroff off the power play and get a coach in here that's going to be able well, to get you. Why, a good- <laughs> that's why one of my moves that I suggested um, when I was talking to my friend Zach that did a couple things for Nitty Gritty before was um. if you're not going to re-sign Risto, you have to make the decision on one or the other if you make this move. But somebody out there that's very good at running the power play from the right side, and we need more righty defensemen, is Klingberg. Yeah. So if you want to go to Dallas, see what because they want more forward help. So when someone like Forster's back, putting in a guy like Tyson Forster and putting in, like, say, Brink, who is a little bit further out, and then picks, they, they might, um, along with whatever defense prospect, because obviously you want a defenseman back, so you see which one of those they ask for. That that'll probably be able to bring in a guy that I feel like I like how Risto's playing, but I feel this team needs somebody that's more of a player style in order to be successful in next year onward. That's more to the Klingberg, like you said, finding a guy that gets it going on the power play so Provi doesn't have to be on the power play. You have your one A power play guy, and then Sandheim if he can do more of what he's been doing since Williams took over. Maybe he can. He needs to go, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but um, you you have to see because Provorov's not a power play guy. Yandel at this point of his career is just not what he used to be, and then you're going to have him off the team next year anyway. But York is probably going to be the guy that ultimately fills the second power play role anyway when he eventually starts playing. So you're going to have. See, I feel like it structurally fits the team better. Where I like what Risto's been able to do. The problem is with the market share, he gets paid 5.4. If he still gets paid that, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, he's, but he's... His game's not worth more than that. Exactly. That, that's more what it is, where Klingberg, because he adds the offense, he's not as good defensively at blocking shots and stuff as Risto, but he adds more of the push the pace up the ice, get out of the exit your zone and enter the next zone really well. He adds that more than Risto Linen does. Um, I believe that's why he would fit a little bit more. Where even if you put Risto in that trade, say they want a defenseman more like Risto Line, and See, you go one, two expiring contracts, yeah. and that resigns Risto Line, and then the you thing, put the guy, trade that could that could even work. So. Here's the thing, though, You're, it's going to be hard to make any of these decisions, and all we're talking about right now is speculation because depending on who the next coach is going to be and or who potentially might be the next general manager or depending on which direction this team is going to go in is all going to depend on. And and those decisions are going to have to be made first before any kind of player movement is made. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. So, but my thing is, I feel like this year, like if you looked at us coming into the season, we were projected higher than Vancouver where now with Vancouver, since Boudreaux came in, and everybody's reestablished. They got Rutherford. Pirlo and I said it before that they brought in Rutherford. We thought they would go retool. But now, obviously, they're not doing that, and they're just going to the push for it. The Flyers have more veteran presence of the Atkinsons and the Hayes and the stuff of the world than even a team. And then when you have Ellis back, you add him in there, you have the bronze of the world, even, than even a team like Vancouver has. So, like, I feel like, 
Um, and also you could argue um, Thatcher Demko is really good, but between if Jones can get back to how he's been more at the beginning, I also think the Flyers play terrible of late in front of Morton Jones for some reason. It's kind of like the Columbus Corpusalo effect when Corpusalo's yeah. team looks worse for some reason. Yeah. I have, <laughs> when yeah. Lincoln's is in net, like they look significantly better. Um, but I'm with you. I feel like the, the big thing for this team is you're not going to push the gun on anything yet because the trade deadline's ways away. Um, and we've seen stranger things with the Flyers. Like, for an example, a season we had 18 different goaltenders. Not that many, obviously, but a million yeah. different goaltenders in, and we saw Eight. the playoffs and and, uh, and got deep into the postseason to the cup run. Yeah, so, I mean, I think this team still has a chance. I think it's more eventually you're going to see certain guys that they're not going to care about salary when people come back. If you're if, like, if for example, if JVR goes cold again and say Wilman's still playing really well and fair, being Frost come back, I don't think Yo is going to be a coach that looks at his price tag. He's going to go, you're Yeah, I see what you're saying. He's going to look at the player and yeah, these guys are playing better and I need these guys to stay. Yeah. yeah. Or if, say, somebody like um, TK struggles for a couple games, you probably do what AV did. And that actually. With some people that works, it gets them going when you sit them a couple games. With others, it doesn't. But um, I, I think um, he's going to handle it a little. I think he hasn't even got a chance to put in his system yet because we barely had any practice. Right. I mean, he only had one full practice, a very short one. Then they had to fly to Montreal. So yeah, yeah. I think um, I think uh, he's definitely uh, a guy that's going to – It look. I like what he's saying, too. He said all the right things this uh, week. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, I am with and, you. Um, I think he's moving the stuff in the right direction because he was absolutely right. First, you had to focus on changing the mindset and just getting the guys believing in themselves again before you had to focus on the one-to-one-to-one strategy because it looked like everybody was just having a lack of confidence and a lack of belief at the time at the end of the um, losing streak there where Yo's kind of got them believing in themselves a little bit more there. And then now you're going to get structurally better as time goes on if you're believing in yourself. Where I think it's like Pirlo said is my closing thing. I think it was more we just wanted to become quicker pace wise. Where if we're sloppy, that was expected because the Flyers weren't quick pace wise under AV at the end. Mm -hmm. So you're probably going to be sloppy because you're used to being slower. Where now that you're going faster, it's going to take a little bit of time to adjust to making it crisper. But it's also leading to them having better possession to start and gaining more confidence in their decision because they're going, oh, I can do that quickly rather than taking six seconds to do everything. So I think they're pushing in the right direction. This team um, has been hit with a lot of the um, people going in and out that were the key structural pieces of the team where some other teams. But that's not an excuse. That's just an observation where right. some other teams have dealt more with bottom sixers going out of their lineup. But um. Yeah. I feel like the Flyers, the biggest thing you could argue is you, the L is similar to Niskanen, how we put so much on thinking Niskanen was Barry Ashby coming back from um, a injury. Like you, you, um, he's a very important person, but like you put all your stock again into somebody where Niskanen didn't really have the injury history, but Ellis does. So you knew you were taking the risk there. That's why I always <laughs> felt yeah. they should have went out and got one other guy that was more of like even like a Matt Benning or somebody that was more of a hold their yeah. own NHL or like six seven than the Sealers of the world who hasn't done terrible for not playing a season all of last year and then having to play most of the games this year. But right. it's just you have a guy that has more NHL experience that's had more success recently at a six seven level. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, man, I, I have to say, like I said, I, I really think there's a lot of things that need to happen with this team. Um, are they going to win a couple games? Sure are. Um, but uh, I, I think they're going to be big time sellers at the trade deadline. Um, is the break going to help them? Yep. Um, it's going to help them get some players back. And then Yo's going to be able to get to see what kind of team he's going to have. And I guess upper management's going to get an opportunity to see Yo and see how he goes. But as far as I'm concerned, this this season is pretty much, a, you know, um, a wait and see now because I don't really think they're going to be good enough to, to do anything in the playoffs or if they do make it to the playoffs, I don't think they're going to. I would love to see them um, do that. That would be a great story uh, for them. You know what I mean? But 
I just feel that they're in too deep of a hole and there's too many things going on with this team. Their power play is still really bad. There's still too many things going on with this team. Well, still a lot of turnovers. They have like 40% since Daryl Williams taken over. Uh, okay. But for the most part, it's still really bad. And their penalty kill is eh. You know what I mean? And there's, like I said, there's a lot of things going on with this team. I hope that. Yo's influence lasts more than a couple weeks or a couple months. You know what I mean? I hope that having that new coach in there with that new voice lasts longer than well, just a couple of the games. The big thing is the players voted when they knew that the firings were coming down the pipe. The players said, keep Mike. That was a player's thing that they said to management, we want to keep, we want him as our. Okay. So you could tell he had the voice in the heart of the locker room because the players the leaders of the team said, we want that to be the general of the team. There you go. Basically. So there you go. I think when that happens, you're going to buy in more. And when you start playing better pace wise, it's going to then kind of domino effect into getting better structurally as time goes on. Cause it's just <sighs> like Mike Yo said, it takes time to build your confidence back up to that level. But we've seen yeah. better play from Provy and uh, Anthony DeMarco tweeted out how Provy and uh, Cooch's stats have been Provy and Cooch esque in these last three games and not how they have been. And then JVR has been more like we've seen JVR in the past where he's streaky, but not unnoticeable where this year in the first 22 games, like you said, he was where just was noticeable. It? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So like, I think with that building, if we're sellers at the deadline, particularly with the contracts we have, I don't see the flyers being able to be full blown sellers. I feel like they would be the, right. how people slot you as like a conservative seller if we are kind of still at like the 500 mediocre mark yeah most but, of our stuff's but, gonna have to happen in the off season anyway but yeah it, it all depends because like i was saying we have a fairly we went from having a hard schedule to having a fairly easy schedule to round out the month now san jose is a good team this year the kraken are better in seattle and are a competitive team but if grubauer has been sloppy this year himself so you can get some past him if he's still struggling kings are better too the more dangerous team there is san jose Right. Um, um, yeah, but either way, yeah. San Jose or Kings, either one, doesn't really matter. Yeah, I would say the most dangerous team we're playing on the Western trip is Anaheim, but that's the last game. That's Tuesday the 4th. But the but the second most dangerous is probably San Jose just because they play, they're playing, one, they don't have as many people out, but two, they're playing a more – complete like Carlson's looking like more like the old Carlson Buechner and pushing the pace they're playing similar to how the Flyers seem like they want to start playing with yo where it's like get the defense to the offense stay yeah. in the zone more so you don't yeah. talk about your defense as much as they used to do that's kind of what the Sharks do so um I feel like if we can get some of these wins there and even get to overtime against some of these teams you're going to make up and be in a good gonna spot in the wild card and be about at worst, probably one to two points back at that point. If you're going to need it. And then you can kind of build up from there. Cause when people come back, like we've seen already, guys are slotting into their comfortability places where before you had guys playing into spots that they haven't done before. Right. That right. They weren't Agreed. Yeah, no, I agree. So I think that is going to help knocking on wood. If things actually go into the new year and people come back and stay mm-hmm. healthy because, NHL seasons of uh, you see it in baseball too because it's 162. But in NHL and basketball, you see the tide uh, where it goes down for seven games or ten, and then it goes back up for teams. Where we're seeing it really go up with Vancouver, the Flyers have a chance to see that same uptick with the schedule they have. If they can take advantage of this schedule, if they can, they have a chance to see that same uptick that I agree. Have. I agree. I agree. But what were those? The that is for the games to be played, my friend. Yep. Well, that has about been our full sixty, uh, not forty-two. We actually went longer on this one and did it almost as long as we do the JB and uh, Steel show. What can we say, man? Yeah. We're long-winded. What? <laughs> but for Steel Flyers, you can find them at Steel Flyers fifty-two over on Twitter and obviously on SteelFlyers.com. You can find Hockey Writers Inc. that he has the shirt on for and all the other great shows over there as well, as you can find me at Sports Fanatic News, as well as on the greatsteelflyers.com, and on Flyers Nitty Gritty as well. 
let's have a great rest of the season and hopefully a better rest of the season. Flyers fans, enjoy the holidays and continue to subscribe on the subscribe button down below or the easy-to-use widget up above. Really appreciate you for it. Go Flyers and stay safe, everybody.